Morning, fish keepers. Cam here from the fishroom.co.nz. We've done it. Made it through to Friday. Let's do coffee. <coughs> oh, that one didn't hit the right way. It's tasty, though. Just hit the wrong part of the throat. All right. That's a good time. Okay. So we've got John kicking around at the back here. Morning, John. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. How, How are you? Cool. Good, thank you. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, so just a wee update. Um, we are planning on having Alexander from the Secret History Living in Your Aquarium on with us. He's just had a bit of a uh, few issues with a power cut that's happened in his area. Uh, last we heard, he has got his power back on and restored. Uh, he's just uh, basically logging everything on and, and booting everything up, and he'll be with us in five or so minutes. So uh, yeah. that is good. So for the meantime, you've got me and John. So um, that's unfortunate for everybody watching, isn't it? <laughs> I'm actually just organising um, the invite now to Alex, so he's only going to be a cool. couple of minutes. Cool. Easy as. So there we go. So, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, hope you've all had a, had a good week. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are, are looking forward to um, this uh, coffee date that we've got quite a planned and lined up, so that'll be a good time. I know I am, anyway. Yeah. Um, Alex has got a really good YouTube channel. Um, interesting, to say the least. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And I would have to agree with both Brian and Rochelle. It is very cold. I was having a conversation with John pre getting on this live of exactly how cold I'm beginning to feel. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's well, not such a fun thing. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of happy because. He's been rubbing it in my nose for months now, how nice it is. And I've been looking at rain out there and snow, so <laughs> it's time to suck it up. Yeah, it's not a good time. It's not okay. Mm. Cool. Had much happening with your fish over the week or anything like that? Um, I've added some albino bristle nose. Cool. Just tiny little ones. Yep. Um, and what else did I add? Um, some autosynclus. Nice. And... I added some more cool orchards. Cool. Yeah. Autos, autos are eluding me at the moment. Every time I go to order them from my wholesalers, they've sold out by the time I get my order in. Yeah. Uh, well, they've been quite scarce over here for a while. Um, and I yeah. walked into my local fish shop and I seen them. Um, and apparently, according to the guy that was working there that day, they've always had them, but I know they've not. So we're not even... <laughs> I just let them see what you have to say. <laughs> but I bought five of them anyway, so yeah, nice. I got them at a good price as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah, the um the happy go lucky tank that I set up uh the other day that's that's got some fish in it now that's it's screaming up auto so mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how we go. Yeah. yeah. You can't go wrong with them because they're so small but they work hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um I was, I was a little bit dubious what other sort of algae eating type fish I could put in there. Um, purely because of the layout of the tank. Like, I don't, it's not going to suit a bristle nose. I didn't think it'd look right with algae eagles of any other description other than Otto's. So I'm just, just yeah. holding out for them to turn up. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah well. Otto's are very seasonal, but they're also very sensational. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was only recently I discovered that there's a lot of different varieties of them as well. Like, you yeah. get zebra autos, and I was quite, I didn't know that until quite. Recently, yeah, yeah. I think we only get one species in unless they're misidentified at, at export. Um, every now and then, the odd things, random off, random sorts turn up, but it's normally just the one species that comes in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Rochelle's asking me how the shell dwellers are. Um, they're fine. They're they're spawn. There's no dramas there. Um, the fry are growing up very comfortably. Everything's going good with them. Um, I think you might have meant the honey grimings that I was losing at a uh, significantly large rate, which I'm still losing at significantly large rates. So um, in saying that, the smaller ones have now basically all gone. So it's just the bigger ones now, which seem pretty rock, rock hard. So, um, yeah, it's unfortunate but yeah, that the shellies themselves are going fine. Um, probably due to go out into their own tank, to be totally fair, um, and just to grow them out for a little bit and, and maybe plan a wee display tank in the shop for them. So yeah, the shellies are the shellies are going really well. So I'm happy with their their progress. 
I do fancy setting up a, a Shelly tank. I really do. Yeah. Also had a spawn of Albino Corridors yesterday and the Bronze Corridors are spawning right at the moment. So nice. Pull their gigs after this. So yeah. The right time of year as well for it, isn't it? For Corridors. Yeah. yeah. So I um I think it's only coincidental, but I've started feeding them the Fish Science Corridor tablet over the last three days. I'm sure it's only coincidental, but I can almost feel like I want to claim that as a one as well. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it is good. Yeah. And it was designed by Corridoris experts. So, yeah. Yeah. It's got all the good stuff in it. Aye. It has. So, yeah, I've I'm not again, many, many times I've said I'm not a, not a fish breeder. So, it'll be interesting to to see how that comes about and, and works with that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I've got. Got the eggs in a Zis egg tumbler at the moment. All oh, right. So it's the first time I've I've played with one of them. So we'll see how that that comes about. Um, and I'm thinking I might put the possibly just put the bronze eggs in a small container with a bit of methylene blue and an air stone and just let them kind of tumble around that way and see if that makes any difference. So yeah, I've never used an egg tumbler before. I've used them for African cichlids. Um, I found them pretty efficient and pretty effective, so um, that was good. But they're a different different type of egg than like sticky Corydoras eggs, so we'll see how that goes. It's all sort of trial and error. It kind of mm -hmm. caught me off guard, um, so I wasn't overly prepared. Had the had the tank space and all that kind of stuff ready, which wasn't wasn't a difficult part. It was oh, I've got eggs. I've got to deal with these before something happens with them, and I didn't yeah, pay too much attention to possibly a better method. So yeah. Cool. What kind of corridoras are they? What's that, sorry? What kind of corridoras? Uh, albino and bronze. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think I've spawned bronze before many, many years ago. This is, this is how little I, I have had much interest in breeding fish. It's just never been on the top of my agenda. Um, we're talking maybe five or six years ago. I think I just put them in a small plastic takeaway container in my fish room and just let them hatch. And within a few days, there was little wiggling things hanging around, and that was, and that was it. So I'm, I'm almost feel like I want to apply that method as well for these ones. Just put them in a small container and and see how they go. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Anything yeah. else been happening in the shop? Uh, yes. So all the three display tanks are all now set up, all with fish, uh, plants and that kind of stuff. So the dwarf tanker deacon tanks got some cyanodontus in it and some lupi, uh, which are stunning, beautiful orangey gold yellow fish, which I absolutely adore. Uh, and then the black water tank is, is slowly but surely coming along quite nicely. Um, I'm thinking of adding a few more cherry barbs to it. I think there's about 15 in it at the moment. Maybe adding maybe five or ten more, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're growing nicely. The dwarf chain loaches are doing their thing in there, and the pearl gromies are growing really well in there. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And then the the other one along, which is the happy-go-lucky tank, um, the plants are all beginning to root in a little bit. There's less of them being sort of found in the morning floating, which is a nice start. And, um, yeah, so the... The sunset platters in there, which are absolutely beautiful, and the green fire tetra as well, which I'm over the moon with. So I might put a few more green fire tetras in there. Um, I think again, there's about 15. I might put another five in there just to bolster that up just a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you're just waiting, waiting for some autos and maybe put some pygmy quarries or some salt and pepper corridors in there as well, just to nice. finish that that off. I think. How are you getting on with the betters? Selling them or having them or the rack? The rack? Yeah, it's it's pretty much done. Um, I'm regretting my decision in filter. Um, I'm very, very underwhelmed with the um, with the marina slimline that I've got, unfortunately. Um, but they were the only ones that would fit. Mm. Uh, I found them ridiculously noisy and I have found them to not actually work all that well. Uh, might mean that I need a bit of bit of extra attention. I'm not sure, but I've I've not been overly impressed with them. But um, yeah, that, that's all pretty much functioning, other than one one bank of of two racks. So um, yeah, we're good to go. Okay. 
Cool. Cool. Well, um, you can see what I can see, so I'll yep. let you do the honours. Good as gold. Hey. Oh, Alex, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, it's been a bit of a mad scramble this morning, but it's uh, excellent now that the power's back. I they, I don't know <laughs> what they're doing on my street, but we've lost the, the electricity three or four times in about three weeks for 12 oh. to 15 hours each time. So yeah. I don't know what's going on. They, they, they won't tell me. Like I asked them and they're like, oh, we're working on figuring that out <laughs> so working on figuring that out that's not really words you want to hear no yeah yeah but you know as a fish keeper between that and the municipal water doing a, like a yearly flush out that threw the tds up an extra 200 points Ooh. it's it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a tr uh, trying time with the city <laughs> yeah i can imagine yeah Especially after just getting back as well. This is the last thing you want. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, uh, I'm actually going to do a video. Uh, I was recording it when the power went out the, uh, earlier. And uh, it was on what happens if you leave the kind of tanks I've set up for 20 days without food or uh, any care or top offs or anything. And that's kind of a either low filtration or no filtration um but there's scuds there's um amphipod you know amphipods isopods uh so like seed shrimp and all sorts of little food plus there's shrimp and there's fish that are usually spawning that have baby fish so it kind of becomes its own food chain uh the way i try to set up most of my tanks so yeah Eagle test on yeah. Yeah. So is I think that oh, far away. Oh, yeah, I think there's a, a slight delay or something. I'm I'm not sure. Is it is it uh how how am I coming through to you guys? You're um, coming through pretty okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. I think I think the joys of of everyone being on three different parts in the globe and running on internet makes just things a little bit weird in different places no matter what. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, par pardon if I speak over anybody in that case. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Were you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what you were basically saying with with the way you were, were running your aquarium sort of leads me into a, a question that I had for you to start with. Anywho, anyway, sure. Um, which is your 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 micro biome food web type situation where you've got everything sort of self self sustaining and self running. Can you go into a little bit of depth on on that and, and how you've come about to be working in that that sort of style of aquarium? Yeah. So uh, for years, I kept fish, uh, mostly guppies. Uh, I bred guppies and other live bears um, since I was probably about 12 is when I started doing it for profit for like a side business or hobby kind of like a little more than a hobby, I guess I'd call it. Um, and that was back when, uh, I, as a teenager, eBay was new for me and I mean, it had just been invented. And so was working on eBay and local classified ads and things like that. And it was, um, always kind of a limited market back then. Uh, but there was more of a local culture in it. And so I was more focused on the fish and the genetics and, um, just production I guess, uh, and I didn't ever have plants. It was always gravel bottom and I was always doing a lot of water changes. And, you know, I really didn't know too much about um, doing, you know, more than adding like uh, some sort of buffer that was a pre-store bot. I didn't know anything about the crushed coral or uh, using shells or anything like that because our water is really soft in Seattle mm -hmm. here. Um, the, it comes out of the tap at 20 to 30 parts per million usually um yeah. and that's chlorinated so that's probably all that's in the water probably off gases mm -hmm. most of it um but i i got into that and then uh kept a, you know a, a handful of a community aquarium with um different roommates and different girlfriends and things that i lived with throughout my 
late teens and 20s. And then uh, I lived in a place where I couldn't keep fish for a couple of years. And all of a sudden, uh, I guess it's seven years ago now, eight years ago now, um, I was I, I met my wife and we had moved into a place together and uh, we were going to get married and everything at that point. And I she had a, an issue with how dark it is in Seattle so much of the year um, called a seasonal affective disorder or SAD yeah, is the exactly. acronym yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. where her vitamin D would get really low and all that. Um, and she had been, she, she had been living in Florida before she moved up here. And so it was a big change for her. And, uh, by the middle of winter every year, she would just get like clinically just really bummed and, um, depressed and her health would go downhill too, like vitamins and everything. Uh, so her doctor said, get a light. And, um, I looked into the lights and they were really, really expensive at that point. So I decided like, maybe I can find a grow light or something instead. So I started doing research on that. And all of a sudden I found, uh, well, I, in college I'd lived at a, uh, kind of a hippie commune basically for lack of a better word, but we did, um, uh, aquaponics there with tilapia and duckweed and the whole like, you know, strawberries and chickens and kind of your, your uh, stereotypical setup there. Um, for for producing food so it kind of with that in my background in my mind and then with what was on the internet like uh, the green machine out of the UK uh, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Takashi Amano stuff I started seeing aquascaping and I had this like desire to get a tank again and I had the des the the need to get a light and I realized I could buy a whole setup and have a fish tank in the living room for my wife and I'd get a fish tank out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it started with one Brilliant. tank and then, and then, uh, and then she's like, Oh, it really helps. You know, it, it feels like, you know, it doesn't feel like the dead of winter in here all the time. So, uh, then it went from one forty gallon to a, another 20 long. And then, uh, then I set up the guest bed room and it's pretty soon now you know now i'm sneaking more tanks in and i've been at or 25 to 35 tanks give or take uh running and i guess the style i i kind of had the opportunity you know if, if you keep continuously it's hard to reinvent yourself or to want to try something totally new you kind of just mm -hmm. keep plugging along at the tanks that you mm -hmm. have and the fact that i got to kind of start all over and that the YouTube was such an active uh, idea forum, so to speak. Um, people like Dustin's planted tanks and stuff like, and I'm friends with Dustin, but uh, I can only take so much of watching his, his intensity and everything, but I loved what he was doing. Um, so I was, I'd get ideas from channels and things and um, it's definitely people like that inspired me. But then I didn't like how calm like some of the Japanese uh, aquascaping was and how high tech that end of it was. It felt a little too serious or for a while. So I kind of yeah. just found a place in between all of that. And uh, I had read uh, Diane Wallstead's book and uh, the the uh, uh, the one on, you know, soil planet tanks um mm -hmm. that she did in like 92 or three that book i read probably about eight years ago now and that that kind of kicked off my idea of doing dirted tanks and uh i did that but then i started keeping shrimp and i realized that the ammonia and the uh and things like that could kind of spike a little more uncontrollably uh if you didn't have a really good sand cap and things like that so then i started getting into the aqua soils and then i actually got a job at a place called Aquarium Zen in Seattle um, and mm -hmm. kind of was taken on as a bit of a, an apprentice uh, under Steve Waldron, who's been an aquascaper first in the Bay Area and then uh, in Seattle. Uh, he's been active in that community and he went and actually took workshops and classes from uh, Takashi Amano while he was still alive. Um, wow. So wow. I was able to learn a lot from him and basically just kind of worked for free at first to get my foot in the door. And then, uh, so between all those things, those are kind of my root influences. And then with the background in, um, 
archaeology and history, I've always been someone who likes to go to the library or likes to go to the local university and, and go dig through papers and published papers and things like that. And, um, I've just kind of kept up with a lot of that. And I mean, if you've seen my channel, a lot of what I kind of relay is whatever's new in that field and try to break it down for people in a little less of a dry way than like an abstract in a scientific paper tends to. And uh, I guess I'll put all those pieces together and a bit of laziness, honestly. Um, I, I don't want a tank that I have to scrub, you know, couple times a week okay. or clean the allergy and all that um like when i was breeding plecos for a while i was like oh man this is messy business you know how much they eat things like that <laughs> so i so i tended you know and also living in seattle uh we never had a house with 800 or 900 square feet so like uh, about 300 square meters you know um so we've always lived in fairly small places so that's also in this kind of got me into the nano fish and then it was kind yeah. of well if i want to build a food chain uh i guess i got to go down i can't really just keep adding bigger fish or anything like that like some people can so yeah, mm. yeah. that makes sense i think the, the the mentality of making your aquarium work for itself which is very much what you, you know when, when you, you set yeah. a tank up in a way where it cleans itself it feeds itself I, I'm, I'm down with that. Like almost every one of my tanks that I've set up, I've always had the free, well, I know myself and I know I'm lazy. Um, so I always go for a setup that kind of just ticks over with very yes. little input. And I find the less you have to do to a tank, the more natural it is anyway. And you discover different things about fish when you leave them alone in the right environment. Oh, 100%. And that yeah. just it, it just opens up a whole different observation level completely, and I love all that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I've got a tank that I assembled. It'll be a year in. Oh, it's a year now, actually. Uh, I should do an update, but it's just a five gallon. It kind of looks like an old milk tin uh, or jug, like the the aluminum ones that's made out of glass. Mm -hmm. And it's been sitting in the window, but I put black worms in it and I put um, little uh, springtails on, on some immersed vegetation above it and, um, you know, made sure to go get pond water that was full of, it had everything from Daphnia. And then I put it in the windowsill so that it would grow algae most of the year. Um, and then I basically put a cleaning crew, like the fish in there are mostly fish like uh, live bears that will eat up that algae and and only mm -hmm. like three of them at a time um i've also rotated through white clouds and and barbs in there just seeing how they do um and then i i found kind of my magic my magic trick for my fish room is the uh malawa shrimp from the island of Sulawesi. um the yes. the malawa is one of my favorite shrimp it's not really in the hobby in the u.s i happen to get it from uh the owner of aquariums and uh steve waldron uh, about eight years ago and i was just starting to get interested in shrimp and he said this is a pretty hardy shrimp and you can breed it unlike the amano shrimp or um some of the other ones and or caradinas that at the time especially a decade ago were pretty hard to to take care of still and so he said, why don't you try these and, and some cherry shrimp? And I found that those, even though they're not colorful per se, they, they clean algae, everything but diatome algae, just phenomenally. And they have babies about every 45 days on cue. They have about 30 to 40 babies. So if you stock a tank and let the little life forms start uh taking foot for like a month or two ahead of everything else. Um, and then you don't overstock it with fish. You can, you can actually get a pretty good bio load of food in there for them. And, and you can top it off and supplement it, of course. Uh, and I do that, especially if I'm breeding or trying to supplement uh, for color enhancement, like feeding them uh, carotenoids or anthocyanin rich foods and things like that. Um, but everything else I kind of think of as trying to keep it 
if I feed it to the fish, then the output will be the fish poop. And then the snails and the shrimp are going to break that down further. And then bacteria will break that down further. Uh, and other than the rich minerality uh, mixture that I've kind of been tinkering with for a few years now that I put in the substrate deep, deep down. And I, I like to do, if I can, a deep substrate of five or six inches, ideally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, unless I'm doing a CO2 tank that's high light, that will allow me then to keep a tank running for like five years without having the soil to get depleted in it. It actually you start to see the stratification just like you would if you took a core sample from like a lake bed or yeah. something. And uh, being an archaeologist by training, that really kind of thrilled me that like a couple of years into keeping when I started to think like instead of just seeing it as like uh, old gravel or filthy gravel um, that I had to gravel back. Now it's like this achievement to get this uh, nutrient rich mulm layer. Uh, and and uh, I was talking to the uh, chemist who works for Seachem as their research and development guy. He's a PhD in microecology, uh, microbe ecology. And um, he was saying that where you see the orange rust line in your sediment, if you've got a tank like that, that's your, uh, your, uh, your, I mean, probably not, you could probably call it uh, anaerobic, not anoxic. I would say, um, it, but it means that there's very low dissolved oxygen because that's where your iron uh, that's in your sediment has already bonded with it. And any lower than that, it, it's kind of a, a good indicator that um, it's not going to have a lot of oxygen in it. And also you can look for, you know, sulfur and methane bubbles building up below that layer. Mm -hmm. And they tend to originate below that orange layer. So once you have a tank up for a couple of years, I really love, being able to use plants and um, even like I'll use a ruby tetra for instance because their color is directly related to the um, the nitrates you know so if the nitrates even get to like 50 um, they start to fade out really quick so I love wow. the the nuances of trying new fish or plants and looking for those cues that and then using test equipment obviously to to validate yeah. yeah but trying to kind of find these cues or um looking at the you know leaves and looking for the different signs of nutrient deficiencies and things or if they're getting leggy or whatever it may be um and using all those things as indicators for what the tank needs and as time goes on i keep kind of tinkering with how small i can make that happen in and how little of mechanical filtration and things like that I need and which species need it like hill stream species rainbows um, top minnows things like that um, a lot of them do need more o2 in the water or flow mm -hmm. to kind of to seem to do really well uh, and breeding like catfish or any really protein rich dieted creature uh, but but for a lot of the community fish that you would traditionally feed like a flake food or something like that, it's amazing how they can just live off the tank as long as you're not overstocking things, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Um, um, Firewall, John? No, no, I was just agreeing. I was just saying, yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's amazing the difference between the two kinds of fish. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. One um, demands so much more than the other. Yeah, a good tip that I've uh, kind of picked up from David Attenborough special was, um, you know, he's like a hero of mine. I, I, I don't know if he's that great of a, a scientist or anything himself, but man, I can fall asleep to that guy in like five minutes. He's like my grandpa, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's like visiting grandpa's house or something, you know, being Absolutely. told a bedtime story. But uh, um listening to one of his nature videos a number of years ago, it struck me when he, he mentioned that predatory animals have their eyes in the front of their head and they have binocular vision. And, and almost always that's the case. 
Well, even if you look at fish, a lot of times you'll see that their eyes either bulge out or they're set closer to, to the front and they either have some overlap or near an overlap, whereas more um, uh, vegetarian or uh, omnivore, uh, omnivorous uh, small fish, a lot of times their eyes are clear on opposite sides of their head, no overlap there. And they have other sensory organs that come into play. But um, I've noticed that that if a fish has has the ability to, to kind of focus its gaze forward, that tends to be a fish that's going to eat a high protein diet and won't work in those those setups that I have. So it's not 100% always the case, but it's something that kind of clicked in my head about mammals and birds and reptiles. And, and I thought, oh, I wonder if that's kind of true about fish. And it, it mm. seems to hold pretty true. So little things like that to me are just like magical discoveries waiting to be found while I'm, you know, staring off into space, looking at my tanks every night for an hour or two. So <laughs> That's really, really fascinating. And it makes a, a lot of sense. And I'm sure there's a, that particular comment there's even a wee light bulb that's ticking off on my head. Oh, well, yeah, that does oh, make sense. I'm sure the few people I'm, in the I'm looking at my, yeah. my puffer fish, the pea puffers, their eyes are clearly for pounds. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. you've got like the auto class, they, they're, they're like looking about like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. Sense. Like, like the ones that clean or even sometimes top minnows. They'll they'll have eyes that are like almost on the top of their head, you know, mm -hmm. and their mouth will turn up also because they're yeah. eating bugs at the surface. So, I mean, all these little things that I think a lot of people, myself included in the past, just take for granted or just say, oh, those fish are like that, you know, didn't really ever give it a thought. They're mm -hmm. cues about how, how we should be treating them, you know, and same with plants, like the the, the little signals and signs can tell you so much. And so I, I like to have a, a, a tank format that I kind of replicate a few different times. And then I'll change one variable in each tank every couple of weeks and, and kind of see what changes and see if I notice anything different or add a new fish. I'm kind of guilty of <clears throat> not holding on to fish more than two or three years each, unless I really fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tend to swap them with friends or bring them to the local fish club. Um, or if I if I breed them, I kind of check them off my list, and that's part of like almost like a little game for me mm -hmm. is is for nano fish anyways is yeah. can I get it to spawn and and I feel like if I can get it to spawn, it's probably somewhat happy or somewhat close to a natural you know vibe for it. So when you say that you you like to tweak, make slight changes on your tanks, do you document the changes you make, or do you just Go for it and or is it is yeah. a process that you've got like you can go back yeah and look at changes and you know honestly uh youtube really helps that because almost every week most of the year i'll do a walkthrough of the fish room every friday mm -hmm. or tuesday um and one of the one of the live streams will be just kind of answering questions chit chatting and just showing all the tanks and so it's really helpful if I'm kind of wondering in my head, like, man, I feel like last year this tank was all uh, Amazon sword plants and now the crypts have taken over. What, you know, and I'll go back and look at the footage and then, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm right or wrong, but whatever. It's, it's a nice um, diary system. But yeah. I also, for a long time, I would use a Sharpie and then I just use tea tree oil on like uh, makeup cleaning pads um for for like a women's makeup uh and facial mm -hmm. exfoliate uh you can get these little tea tree, tea tree oil pads um and they they take the sharpie off glass really easily because the dry erase pens just don't show up well enough it, most of the time for me but a lot of times i will note the parameters and uh anything like if i have a, a spawn or whatnot i'll, I'll put it on the side of the tank not on the front glass, but I'll, I'll note it on the side or I'll put a post-it note on it or whatnot. But yeah, I'll usually do something like that. But uh, I'm fortunate enough right now that my life is fish with YouTube and with um, consulting and, and now doing talks and things like that. Like it's become, uh, I used to be graphic design half the time and this, 
the other half for the four years of it, but the last two years uh, and with the lockdown, um, this kind of became viable with the help of my wife for insurance and medical um, coverage. I can get that mm -hmm. through her work, luckily, and uh, I'm very grateful to her for all she does to hold it down for us. She's the bread breadwinner for sure, but um, you know, I've always been someone who I don't really, I, I've never owned a new car or I don't go buy new clothes. Usually I'm one of those, uh, go to the uh, secondhand store or make it or only buy it from like here and there from really special occasions. So I tend to use things and I tend not to, to spend much money it, it, other on than on the hobby. And, and, and I suppose, uh, Dr. Pepper, my biggest vice. So. <laughs> Um, and we've got a couple of questions from Rochelle. Sure. Um, I'm on the back. I'm just going to bring it up on the screen. Cool. Um, Rochelle's one of our regular viewers, so um, she's asking. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll take that. Are you, okay. You read that? I'll yeah. take that off now. Yeah. Two okay. questions. What are your five favorite fish species and uh, why? What is the most unseen fish you own? Um, okay. So, uh, you own, uh, oh, and you question it's alive. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, I think so that I would like say that, from Michelle's coolie loaches that she never, never seems to see. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I actually have one crazy coolie loach that is always in the front glass. As soon as the lights start, uh, I, they have a one hour dimming switch on that tank and, um, as soon as that happens or food comes out and he's big, he's, he's probably like a, a six inch, probably he's, he's big five wow. or six inches. One of the biggest ones I've ever had. Uh, he almost looks like a dojo loach or something now. Uh -huh. um, but he's, I've had him a long time and he's still trucking. I think he's probably four or five, but he comes out and he just runs up and down the glass all the time every night. And, uh, but no, I've had that issue with Cooley loaches. I have thought, that they all died. Um, dojo loaches, when they're young in a planted tank, I've had that. Uh, the the very worst I've ever had, though, I, I would have to say are um, banjo catfish. Um, those things just headlong bury themselves. If you have sand or any sort of substrate, they're going to hide, and they have evolved very specific barbels and antennae to detect food without even having their eyes out of the sand. So they're able to sense, you know, a little food or, or like a scud or, or a worm or blood worms. They're able to get that in the dark, you know, right from under it. And which is incredible to watch. Same with some of the goby species and things. Um, Schismata gobius amapluvulos amapluvulosis. Um, they're, they're sometimes called dragon gobies. They're a, a small little oh, goby. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and they're wonderful fish, but you, you kind of need to keep them in a non-planted tank that has sand that contrasts them a little bit um, and then stone. Uh, but they'll, they're, they're big time hunters like pea puffers in that you can see their eyes track and they lock on and then they kind of get this serious look and they kind of shimmy back like a couple paces and then all of a sudden you know or they'll settle into the sand and then they'll you know pounce and and uh, hunt so those are ones that i don't see very often but when i do i'm always impressed by them um wood cats are another one that i just never see i love them so much but i only see them if i go in the fish room in the middle of the night and feed them like blood worms and black worms that are live mm -hmm. black worms and turn like the lights all off in the room and then wait with like a little led off to the side. And, you know, I'll hear them splash a little bit. Uh, but like Tatia mosaica or, or, or something like that is another species that I thought I had killed them all. And then, you know, sure enough, uh, when I moved my, from my old house to this house two years ago, there were like all of them in a log, you know, together. So, uh, yeah, as far as my five, Favorite fish, uh, panda loaches are one of my very favorite to work with. I think they're an incredible fish. 
They're a 100% shrimp friendly in my experience for Neocaridina anyways. Um, I, which is weird because they'll eat scuds and other things like that here and there. Um, but they don't seem to want to eat the shrimp. And so I've really loved having some tanks that are non-heated, um, good aeration and filtration and good water changes on them. Uh, but I can do, uh, you know, a, a nice, blue dream or something like that shrimp and actually get the colony to grow and then keep 10 or a dozen uh panda loaches and they they're really expensive unfortunately uh 15 to 30 dollars over here usually a fish generally for you know a one inch fish feels like a lot yeah. but i i really mm. do love them yeah i almost bought a group of them at the weekend as well I seen them in oh, my really? local fish shop. And I was mm -hmm. I've never kept them before, and for the same reasons you like them, I've I've wanted to try them. For my my tank that I've got upstairs, but um, I opted against it. I didn't. And I guarantee I'll go back to buy them another time, and they'll be gone. Yeah, that's Always the gone. thing is they're very they're very rare, and they're going to be they're good. They should be endangered already, quite frankly. Um, they only mm -hmm. live in one river and it forks into two major forks that are pretty far apart. Um, another little trick about those is there's one, the Northern fork of the river, those ones retain their black and white color into adulthood or more of a cream and, and, and dark Brown or black grayish color. Whereas the, the other Southern fork, um, which is a little warmer and a little more uh, like tropical or temperate kind of temperatures in between there. Uh, lots of tannins and things fall into the river as well as I hear. Um, those ones tend to go to like a buttercream and off yellow kind of color and their pattern changes to a chain link or even like spotted sometimes. So um, you can tell which one you've got by that. And if you've got the ones from the northern half of the river, they're the ones that are in the National Preserve. And for a while, they they did a license. I think there were five people in all of China licensed to collect them. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why they were so hard to find. That and nobody had bred them in captivity until a couple of years ago, at least in any number. Um, but uh, a guy by the name of... Um, oh... I'm just basing on his last name, but he he uh, owns a company called Bioaquatics in Florida. His name's Andre uh, or Andres. Um, but yeah, he's he's uh, was able to figure it out by using straws from bubble tea. You know what bubble tea is yeah. like uh, the, the Korean and Japanese style um, little drink. So those extra. So like this kind of size straw hole. And he put them in substrate, straight up and down. And uh, every other cave and uh, you know setup he tried didn't work. But when he packed those halfway with sand and put them straight up and down, and then just scattered leaves around them, he found that they would actually come up since they articulate at the waist. That the males would be in those tubes, but there needs to be enough room for the female to come in. So like a little, like a drinking straw, a normal one doesn't work too well. Uh, but he figured out, and I guess that's how he was spawning them. And he shared that with me. And I thought, wow, I would have never thought to try that. So uh, he, found, he he came up with the idea. Yeah, he came up with the idea because pictures of the river they're from. And apparently there's these um, very small freshwater crabs and or, and or mussels. But one of the two... Um, makes these holes in the ground like little tubes and um, uh, that's what he was kind of trying to mimic I guess um, yeah, yeah. So that's why it needs to study how yeah I was gonna say, isn't, it, isn't it nuts and crazy how nature works this one species does this and then the other species manages to use it and the next like everything just works together in little areas of different parts it's just fascinating. Oh, yeah. Nature does what nature does. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I feel like it. I like fish. I used to like colorful fish, you know, for a long time. Colorful, flamboyant fish. That's where it was at. 
And now I like fish that care for their young or that have some really interesting behavior. Um, mm -hmm. That's what really excites me now. Um, and I'm getting into keeping a lot more native North American fish because there's some that have some pretty complex um, traits and, and behaviors. Uh, but same uh, to, to continue the little list quickly, I'd say CPDs are on there. Um, Lake Inlay, I could list five species from Lake Inlay as my top five easily. That's my favorite biotope. I, you know, I don't know why, but it just, it seems so magical to me. And there's so many endemic species in this, you know, 40 kilometer long lake that's only 15 feet deep. Yet there's 56 species in that lake. And uh, I think 16 are endemic or something like that to, to that um, water basin. Um, but I like CPDs and erythromycrons. Those are always really cool fish or the emerald uh, dwarf rasbora as they're called, which is they're not really emerald at all. And they're not a dwarf version of anything. And they're not a rasbora, <laughs> but <laughs> that's what we call them here in the U.S. So, uh, so I opt for it. Yeah. Um, but then I also, I've been getting into wild bettas lately. That, that would probably be in my number three, uh, stiffodons are probably in there three or four, uh, top three or four. Uh, and it just, I couldn't really pick one species, but I, I'm blown away by the, uh, incredible way that, uh, there's, they don't know how many there are, honestly, but there, there could be up to a few hundred undiscovered species from some of the experts I've talked with, uh, because the Pacific islands out in the far Pacific, all the way to like Palau and Fiji and Guam, they have them, but all the way into Australia and Indonesia, they're also found in the Philippines. Um, and w a lot of them, when they spawn, they live in the freshwater and they spawn larval um, young, which are only a few cells. You know, they're very, very tiny. They're like plankton. And they get washed out uh, down a creek uh, from some island they're born on. And then they go float out at sea and they fatten up on, you know, diatoms and, you know, little flagellate life forms and stuff. Um, and then they come back to the fresh water when they're very small uh but some of them can climb crazy waterfalls they've evolved their their pelvic fins to be a perfect little suction cup which mm. is really cool and so yeah. they can stick to the glass but they can stick to a rock that way too and so they can rest and then they can kind of wiggle and use their other fins to kind of scoot up and then stick again and then it, because of that they can climb waterfalls really well and um that's that's one of the trade you know kind of the trademarks of of that genus but they come in every color of the rainbow and when they spawn for you it's it's really beautiful i've i've never tried even to to run through bringing them into a, a saline environment and keeping it you know tropically uh, uh like calibrated to tropical microfauna seems like a tall order and i think a few germans uh and a few uh pol polish folks i've read online have done it but for the most part they're they're all wild caught still um but i love keeping them i just i feel bad that the, it's not a more sustainable fish in the sense that they're not being bred in the hobby really so mm -hmm. yeah but i i would say that that's probably a list of you know four or five six something something like that fish that I've just, you know, the, the last one I would say is baddest, um, like uh, Dario Dario or mm -hmm. baddest baddest. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I like both of those, but um, those are just, they're very similar to a little cichlid. In fact, I've even seen them take care of their young for a week or two sometimes. And um, they can be really vicious. This little one inch long fish can kill its mate uh, and does frequently. They can change sex uh, and be fertile both ways. You know, a female can turn male and a male can turn female. Um, 
in midlife. And so they're kind of just this enigma to me um, as I bred them. That and for years I was like, why can I not find a female? It took me years to get a female. And uh, I finally found out from a guy who lived in uh, India. He said that the males are very similar to cichlids. And so they go into these rice paddies and, and shallow marshes and it's it's in the as the dry season's going starting to to begin the water gets really low and that's when they spawn and and pair off and then they do it again uh another round of it when the rainy season's about to start but when they're in those low uh water areas sometimes as little as an inch of water they build a little nest area like they clear out the algae and the mulm and and the, and they usually have sand or little pebbles like little uh, rocks that they put in a circle and sometimes they'll even decorate the outside with a contrasting color which is cool wow. uh, yeah and then they'll lay the eggs in there and guard it while the eggs are there and sometimes they'll even guard the you know the the very young babies for a few days even though most of what you read online says that they don't have parental care i think it's just really inconsistent um but breeding those, uh, when I talked to the guy, he said it's because the males, when they go out collecting, they come out and they defend the nest, whereas the, and they're bright red, whereas the females, they hit the deck and they hide in the substrate. So collectors figure people want bright fish anyways, and it's just so much easier to get a little inch long fish that's literally coloring up more and, you know, lunging mm -hmm. at your little net than... <laughs> than uh the females which take off yeah um, but that's why it's pretty difficult to find a female according to a, a, a guy i was talking to who collected them yeah. for retail um, sorry, yeah, talked, sorry cam just before we move on you mentioned um the like you're getting right into the the north american natives yeah um i noticed on your facebook page um a few days ago you posted sticklebacks yeah yeah um is that the three spine stickleback it's the three spine correct yeah yes. we have them here as well oh we yeah that yeah. same one yeah we've got them like maybe 20 meters for this house oh nice uh, and i've done the the thing with my daughter and i've, I've pulled them out and done the biotope and things like that but oh cool talking about um unique behaviors oh man sometimes they're amazing yeah i mean you you've probably seen it but that's one thing i've wanted to document on this channel for a long time because i i, I go and i sit by the local ponds and creeks that have them here too and yeah. not only they are one of my very favorite fish as well um and partially because we don't have that many fish where I live uh, that are aquarium sized, uh, <clears throat> but because the, the the behavior for spawning is incredible. For one, they color yeah. up a beautiful blue or green, uh, depending on the creek they're in here. Um, and sometimes they're even like blue and red together, mm -hmm. um, the males. And the then males the females get up. Yeah, yeah. But the, the actual, um, one of the really fascinating things to me too about them is that they have uh, <clears throat> the oldest research done on them and evolutionary biology, uh, some of the first evolutionary biology looking into epigenetics uh, was done here in Washington, uh, in Lake Washington, because when humans uh first moved into or i should say european humans first moved into like washington <clears throat> they clear cut everything and they dumped all the city sewer into this lake and it was a major disaster i mean it was people wouldn't swim in the water people would get giardia and dysentery and all these other things typhoid you know all the terrible diseases of the turn of the century and stuff mm -hmm. you'd get from the water and uh the visibility was less than a foot in the lake from uh, from just all the uh, silt and problems because they also dammed up rivers and then they diverted other things and drained like sawmills and things and pulp. And uh, when they decided, well, we need to clean this up because the whole metro area is kind of built in, building up around the, this 
a 60 kilometer long lake um that's kind of the whole metro area for seattle is between there and then the puget sound uh and they decided to clean it up in the 1950s well they had already done studies in the 20s and 30s on sticklebacks but the sticklebacks in lake washington had almost no spines and mm -hmm. almost no armor and almost no coloration mm -hmm. and as the lake cleared up all the way through the 1980s their spines grew all the way to around you know a centimeter centimeter and a half in some cases and you can tell by the angle of the spine how long the spine is you can tell if they're being predated on by birds and other like mammals whereas mm -hmm. um if it's a barbed spine that's for those whereas if it's a straight up and down spine that means that they're being predated by aquatic uh, animals like bass or something like that and then the um armor on them they have up to 28 plates of armor and as mm -hmm. little as none and it's directly like you can graph it and it's a linear correlation with the water visibility and the amount of predation going on in their area so you can literally find one uh on a, from a pond or a lake around here and you can tell how clear that water is if someone brings you that stickleback and you, you're familiar with them and that and i've also charted as a personal project i've charted where they're born and um they they're realizing now that you know they couldn't have just straight evolved through selection in three or four decades that much so now they're realizing that this is a very uh, ancient lineage of fish. It's been through a lot of changes and that's all stored in its genetic code. And rather than having to totally re-evolve it, it has an epigenetic marker, kind of like us going through puberty where certain environmental cues, ages or whatever it may be, hormones will trigger it, like grow that spine or grow, um, you know, uh, start using lycopene to sequester that red for spawning season or whatever it yeah. may be and put that into your pigment. And so I love being yeah. able to, to take that little tiny fish and read all about, you know, I can tell you what part of the lake it came from, whether it was from the marshes or whether it was from the Creek in the spillway where the, there's gravel um, or whether it was from open water. Cause if they're from open water, they have a silver belly to, uh, mimic the sky and reflect UV light for predators below. And then they, they have a dark, dark gray or, or even blue t body top uh, above um, down their lateral line is where it splits um, because from above they want to be dark so that they can't be yeah. spotted for, for birds. So they're, they're I mean, they're, they're an absolute perfect teaching tool about evolution and epigenetics and, um, and, and they're just tough. I mean, I've, I've had them survive a hundred degree temperature in my pond one summer. So uh, like 40 Celsius, you know, or something like that. And mm -hmm. um, they survived that. And then they've also been under three inches of ice. So they're a really <laughs> fascinating creature. And where they've been found in lakes in Canada and Alaska and Greenland even, um, they've completely evolved new uh traits and things that aren't seen in any other populations and genetically they, they would probably i mean it's debatable but they're, they're probably different species within as little as you know ten thousand years they're no longer uh, able to spawn with the stickleback from the outside world so it's really fascinating too how they get stuck in these remote lakes and things and how their eggs can be digested by a duck or uh, a, a most waterfowl and then be, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll say excreted uh, and still be viable. So, yeah, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll shut up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, they are. They're fantastic fish. And the fact yeah. that they're spread right across the Northern Hemisphere just shows you how, yeah. how long we've been about. Yeah. We've actually That's in Scotland really got good, one... Man one location where they've got um, the spineless sticklebacks. But uh -huh. it's, a, it's a closed off um, loch or lake. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've never found them there yet. But um, yeah, 
They are really, really fascinating. Do you have the nine spine also there or the four spine or two spine? Um, I think we have the four spine. I've never heard okay. of the nine spine. But um, I know okay. we've got the, the three and the four and then the, the, the no spine one. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll find that blog because cool. I've got pictures of them. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I've got a video clip of them actually building the nest as well or the male. So oh, I'll cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to, what, what I got off track saying, and then I'll shut up about sticklebacks, but you've probably seen it, but in case anybody else hasn't, the, it's amazing. Sticklebacks are able to, the male's able to size up the female, and the female gets fat like a square or rectangle, or like a rectangle almost. She kind of looks like a pea puffer when she's gravid. And the male's able to look at her for a few days and know to the millimeter how big around she is. And then he builds a little tunnel that goes down and out and he agitates her when he's ready to spawn and he bugs her and bugs her and bugs her rather than doing like an elaborate dance necessarily. Usually uh, they do shimmy and shake and stuff too, but usually they do this thing where they just kind of pester the female, uh, nip at their fins lightly and, and poke them in the belly with their, their nose and then they'll they'll get chased finally and they'll go down into the substrate into the nest and they'll go through that tunnel that's tapered and they've built that tunnel specifically so she'll wedge herself in it when she chases them and then in some locations they actually have a stick that they build uh, on the top like a, a little twig and it's going uh like crisscross to the to the main tunnel that's tapered so the female gets stuck right here and then the male comes out and he pulls on the stick and the the sand on top of it collapses on her so she's wow. struggling but that pressure on her body actually uh triggers a, a, her to release her eggs and then he fertilizes the mound and guards it so i mean yeah they're, they're i don't know they're just endlessly fascinating the more i i read about them and jump they're one of those fish yeah. i just love watching from the side of the creek you know yeah um it's one of those ones that i think from childhood it's one of the first ones you see yeah and it's one that stuck with me throughout my whole life yeah really cool yeah they sound like an absolutely phenomenal fish we don't have them here i know literally nothing about it but i've been hanging on every single word during that that was wow mm -hmm. that's cool <laughs> yeah um, yeah. Something I sort of wanted to bring up is um, the way that you present your stuff. You have this incredible way of holding everyone's attention as well as giving in some incredibly in-depth information. Is this something that you've developed or is this just, just the way that you are and you always just can analytically bring out all this information and or is it, does uh, it involve a lot of know, deep diving and researching? Well... So I am a pretty obsessive person um, and I could obsess about anything, any number of things, because I love when somebody lo is in love with what they're doing, whether that's a, a, a Mason or a, a tailor or, a, you know, a whatever, a, an angler. It doesn't matter. Like any, but any profession or skill, um, when you see someone who's mastered something or they love it, um, and they know the nuances and the subtleties of it like that to me is like such inspiration like that's what life's about to me is is those um, uh, true mastery and at least if you can't do it uh, at least uh, knowing others um, who can and then being able to you know access their their mastery of it but I love seeing that. And one thing that I've always felt was a bit, um, you know, I feel this way about math, but I'm, it's a little too dry usually, but um, you know, I have, I had videos on the Fibonacci sequence and why it's found in the way fish scales are, are arranged and what it has to do with, um, you know, um, uh, hydrodynamics or um, S start motion and baby fry. So I like to read like physics papers or uh, botany papers or whatever is coming out. I love 
seeing when somebody's put years of work into something and they're excited about it. And if I can access that and try to share that excitement and maybe get someone else to, to learn about things, I really enjoy that. And so I would say it starts with me doing a lot of researching and a lot of like um, introverted stuff. Like I'm just on my own. I, I have access through friends and through subscriptions to a lot of scholarly journals um, and a lot of archives that I've just learned how to get, you know, into this university or that university, look up this paper, or that paper. And um, also, you know, YouTube is a great resource. It's just YouTube, uh, Wikipedia, they're all kind of, you know, in my mind, just as dubious sometimes about the uh, authenticity of uh, when you need to be very precise. Uh, but if it's just for entertainment, you know, do whatever you want. But for me, when I'm trying to relay, I try to go to the ichthyologists and the people that have dedicated their life to that, that fish, uh, read about that. And then I try to go and find out, well, then who cataloged it and who discovered it? Um, mm -hmm. is there an interesting story there? Is there a human story there? Were the, were these fish, uh, evolutionarily something interesting? Is there a story, um, like the sticklebacks, you know, is there something like that, um, hidden in the behavior or the appearance of the fish? Is there, um, like in Corydoras, uh, or as Dr. Anthony would say, Corydora, uh, He'll, he'll be mad if he hears that. So that's why I had to do it's that. Cold. Um, it's already cold. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if, if um, like, the reason they have venom glands in their side, but don't really have a great way to use them other than to poison themselves in a bag, um, <laughs> you know, some of these things are, 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 are pretty interesting. But I just love being able to find the interesting tidbits and then relay them. But I've always had a mind that's obsessed with um, like trivia, because I feel like if you have this line of facts, you can put them together in a story. And the more stories you kind of have, like, here's my story about fish and here's my story about plants. And then soon you realize they're all the same story, like the world all overlaps when you start learning mm -hmm. more about each field. It's incredible how interdisciplinary studies whether it's like biomimicry and like the defense uh department you know studying fish for the speed of torpedoes moving through water or whatever it may be it's these these crossed uh, uh these converging studies or tidbits that you may never think of putting together and someone does or 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 i like to encourage experts of different things to talk because as we all listen to each other maybe it will spark something in someone's mind and maybe you know something new will come from it uh and if nothing else you know hopefully it will encourage us to find joy and wonderment in the complexity of the world but if nothing else um maybe also a bit of understanding and um value to even mundane things you know um yeah. i don't i don't have kids but if i did i would like I, something i say to my friends when they're whining is like how can you be bored like boredom is a luxury if you have a roof over your head you have food in your stomach like you don't have a crisis going on right now like how could you be bored the world is incredible like yeah. even if you're stuck in a in a room with your own mind it may be quote unquote boring but you have so many places to go with just your past experiences and yeah. things you're wondering how they work. And um, I, I like to encourage that spark in others. And then I like to watch them once that's ignited. I like to talk to them and watch them, you know, fuel it and come and tell me something that I didn't know, you know. And, and my channel is really just all me learning what I'm interested in or what people ask questions about. If I don't know, I try to track it down, try to talk to the experts. And then if I have little stories or trivia that I've acquired, uh, I put it together. But ironically, I can't remember someone's name when I meet them the first time, uh, half the time, or a phone number ever for the life of me, um, <laughs> even since before cell phones, you know, like I was never good at that. I write it, I'd write my, my arm as a, as a teenager was always covered in notes, like 
from, <laughs> you know, don't forget your math homework. Don't, you know, whatever, don't do this, do that. Um, so I, it's odd, but I'll remember how much a fish weighed uh, that set the record for size and what year it was caught, you know, or something like that. But for some reason, I just can't do it with uh, <laughs> some of the everyday, everyday things. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever you're doing, well, what you're doing is, is phenomenal and fantastic. So please continue it. It's, um, oh, thank you. Very uh, much appreciate uh, it by many people. Well, I'm honored to uh, come on the show and to, to to meet you guys face to face, you know, and so it, uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I'll keep doing what I'm doing as long as, uh, you know, YouTube, YouTube has become now, it's trickiest now because uh, when it becomes your full-time job and you've decided to say, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, um, then you... I mean, you really need to to rely on it, and it, you know, you, YouTube's kind of a roller coaster as far as views and this and that, and chasing clickbaity stuff and thumbnails, and it's all such a struggle in my mind of, you know, what is being authentic to your to yourself and what you want to communicate. Um, and to me, as long as I put the educational in, in there, and I'm not way off basis of what we're talking about that's mm -hmm. kind of where i've settled for my my ethical mm -hmm. stance on that and i try yeah. not to sell anything that i i don't truly believe is making the hobby better so like i'll i'll, mm -hmm. I'll support you know arkoff for instance like dr anthony's uh research project and his fundraising and stuff like that yeah um but I'm never going to, like, I get emails constantly now uh, with the channel where it's at, just of, um, you know, here, we're going to send you uh, this filter and we'll give you $500 to make a video on it. And it's, I'm like, you know, maybe I'll try the filter, maybe if I need a filter, um, but I can't take your money for that. Like, I'm not going to be jaded or, or, or what's the word? Um, uh, attempted like, or, or or swayed mm -hmm. by by you know that sort of thing and so you know the bigger or the longer your channel is around and the more um i guess credibility that you manage to gain um which i try to do by you know when i make an error in a video i try to correct it or post it or take the video down if i got something really wrong scientifically or or whatnot um mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, it kind of builds on itself to the point where now I'm working harder on each video because there's more people watching, there's more experts watching, there's ichthyologists watching that specialized yeah. in that fish, you know, their whole career. And um, it's pretty exciting now when um, it, it's uh, you have someone who's a specialist in it and then they want to talk to you more about it and you're like oh oh they don't have anything to say like that i screwed that really up that up really bad you know <laughs> so um you know it's it's all a big learning process that way but um it's it's also a mix for me i've never liked to be an over um produced channel like bells and whistles and mm. um like this this set this fake green screen is something i made with um AI and then Photoshop, basically, I kind of put some pieces together, but it was my, my, if, if I were a billionaire, like what my dream, uh, you know, office or den would be, be a map room and a, you know, a full of scientific periodicals and, uh, then mm -hmm. aquariums and plants. <laughs> so, yeah. Sounds like a dream. Yeah. Um, yeah someday maybe. Yeah. Since you've been starting, uh, since you've started doing your YouTube, um, obviously it's opened up opportunities for you out with your own channel, yeah. isn't it? Um, for example, yeah. you the work you do with Ivan McCauley, um for the Green Earth Alliance is something yeah. that started a couple of years ago. And you, yeah. it was you and Ivan and his sister um, that launched that. So, um, I mean, that's that's a, a power for good. Um, that's, that's come directly from YouTube. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, I always have looked up to Ivan since yeah. since even before I kept Planet Tanks. I just saw his photography, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know who he was. And then when I put it together that 
oh my gosh, he's, you know, for, for lack of a, in my mind, and, and this is just my opinion, but he's almost like the, the Amano uh, right now of like South America in my mind. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, he's just uh, incredible. He's an incredibly kind guy too. And so I, I reach out to my, my heroes, you know, or to my, the people who inspire me um, or the people who um, are clearly experts or, or have a lot of experience in something that I'm trying to understand. And um, when I re reached out to him initially, it was like talking to an old friend and then we yeah. hit it off. And then, and then he was like, you know, uh, you know, we can use your, youtube because i said yeah I'll, you know let's promote your book like i love you know you gave me a, an early copy and um or i bought an early copy at that point in our friendship uh and i ordered it from the uk printing uh which came out earlier than the us printing so i paid 300 dollars with shipping for this book at the time but that's how excited i was about his book you know and i like i said i don't spend money on much um <laughs> and and that yeah. I, you know, his, his uh, Orinoco book, what just blew my mind that showing the fish from aquarium community tanks in their natural habitat, it was so needed in the, in the hobby. And even if everyone doesn't own the book, the images get around, you know, they're, they're stunning yeah, yeah. the work he does. And, and also just knowing it's surprising sometimes to know in the dry season that, you know, uh, uh, what a Bolivian ram might be able to be in alkaline water or something, you know, like, cause the, the set, the, the groundwater might, might, might be sitting on limestone and uh, you know, it might have rained enough that it dilutes the, the tannins and everything and they overflow out of the area or, you know, or that a pH could be as low as three for some fish like wood cats when they spawn. So the fact that he was going these places and taking pictures and documenting the extremes, uh, even just within the one river basin is just, mm. I don't know, it, it blew my mind. So I really looked up to him. Plus he's an artist, like a classical um, artist, you know, with, with mixed media paints and things. Mm -hmm. And I've done that my whole um, life. And I did that for a living both as a tattoo artist, a graphic designer and a mural artist. But I also had a studio for um, I, I had a studio with a gallery space in Seattle. Um, and although it feels like a different life now because fish have kind of taken over and at my time and and also I just kind of got tired of the art world. But um, for a while, I was doing exhibitions where I, I, I had a show in Cairo. I had a show in Paris. I was shown in LA. Um, so my artwork for a while was actually gaining traction. And, you know, I'd sell something that was expensive here or there. But for me, I always would want to give away the art to kids who were in love with a piece or like uh, <laughs> someone who'd come in who's broke. And I'd be like, well, they're staring at it for two hours or whatever. They keep coming back to this piece and they're like, I got 50 bucks or whatever. And that's who I'd let the piece go to, even though on the wall, it was supposed to be two grand or whatever. And the gallery gets half or whatever it may be. Um, and then just the socializing that came with being an artist for a living. Um, yeah. Now it's a bit different. I feel like the internet has, has allowed some, some freedom in people to market themselves and have a website of their own and, and these kind of things. But when I was at my peak of all that, it was you had to be friends with this wealthy person who owns a gallery who's a trust fund kid or whatever mm -hmm. you know like and that's who's going to buy your art if you want to make a living in any other way other than licensing or selling like farmers market crafts you know or something like that which in seattle it, it's one of the most expensive cities in the country you know, I, I worked my hardest and the most I made and, and I'm open about it because I think workers and people should I mean, I, I don't I don't feel like others should be obligated, but I think it's helpful for people to be transparent about what they make for what they do. And, um, you know, I was working like 80 hours a week between painting and then going to the farmer's market, sometimes 90. And um, and I loved it. It was art, but I hated the selling of it handling the business of it, paying the taxes, doing all that. And um, 
you know, I was making, I think 54,000 was the most I made in a year uh, that, that I felt was in a sustainable way. Like, yeah, you might become a good enough artist that you can sell each piece for that, but that's pretty rare. You know, it was more like a thousand dollar piece here, a bunch of $20 postcard or uh, posters and some $4 postcards or whatever. Um, and it was just always a grind, no health care, no retirement. Um, and so I kind of got out of it, even though I, that was the original love of my life. And it was very focused around nature, too. But I think now I feel like between teaching and learning on my channel, I love both those things. Those are probably my my first loves in life is just learning anything new. Just blow my mind. I love it. Um and you can learn from everyone, you know. Um, so social media has really opened that up. It's just I wish our society put more emphasis on fact checking or validation of information uh, rather than just the uh, acquiring of it, you know. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes it's it's uh, especially in America, the last four or five years or whatever, I guess eight years, whatever it's been now. Um, politics and media and everything, it's kind of like the loudest voice and the most repeated message sometimes gets the day. And um, it's kind of the opposite of what I stand for, as well as paywalls and um, charging for education. Like I, I, to be a member on my site, you get access to my, like on YouTube, you get access to my bibliography and a little bit of extra content. But even then, if anybody asks me, I'll give them all that for free. Because I just feel like gatekeeping educational information that's not even mine. I didn't do the years of research to find out stickleback evolution works the way we talked about. Um, but I do think that in America, getting an education has become so expensive that you can become almost an expert if you understand how to vet sources and find good experts without having to pay for it. You can kind of um, learn yourself a lot of things, maybe not being an electrician or being a doctor, but a lot of different fields are pretty accessible once you kind of learn to sift through what's to believe, be believed and what's not. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned um, your site. Have you got a website as well? I do have um, an art centered site still. Right. It's somainkdesigns.com. <clears throat> Soma, <clears throat> as in S O M A, the mythical um, drug or medical cure in um, Sanskrit tradition, but also in Brave New World, it's like the 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 medic the the um, the medication they give everyone to keep them docile and happy and and in a, this dystopian future. Uh, but it's also in, in um, Sanskrit, it, it essentially means where mind and body meet or where, where your mental thoughts meet your physical actions. And it's this kind of concept of, I'll stop going on a tangent, I'm sorry. Um, but, but basically where you're, you're, you have a thought in your head that's abstract and information and some electrons or you know they didn't think of it that way back four thousand years ago but from an abstract thing that you can't hold on to you can draw a blueprint and you can have someone build something and that idea of when your your soul or your thoughts or whatever you want to call it goes from intangible to tangible um that was another early meaning of of soma was kind of the intersection of where the ethereal and the grounded meet. Um, mm -hmm. So I liked that name and that was the name of my tattoo studios for a number of years. And then as I did more and more tattoos, I realized um, a lot of the people I was tattooing had uh, businesses or they were in bands or they were um, doing different things like that. And now it's been 20 years since I started tattooing. So it's been, uh, it's changed quite a bit, you know, uh, it, it was still a bit more fringe, I would say then. Mm -hmm. And, um, it now it's so mainstream. And even as I was, when, when I, when I closed my shop, 
it had become fully mainstream by that point, you know, uh, all those reality shows and, you know, uh, it was just as likely that I'd have, you know, a 60 year old woman come in with her daughter as a biker or whatever, you know, uh, whereas the first few years it was like all punk rock guys and goths and bikies and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, so um, the, I'm just, I was looking at your shop on your YouTube channel and I noticed that you've got a better design. Um, oh, yeah. Design? Did you do yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Those are um, originally those are woodcuts. Right. Uh, and then I did, uh, I touched them up with a Sumi ink. And in each case, I took took the ink and I ground it from carbon and um, from aquachar and Sumi ink half and half, uh, like the Japanese ink that you put into a mortar and pestle and, mm -hmm. and grind. Um, and so I used the tank water and I used bioactive, which is just symbolic because, I mean, now it's all digitized. But... The originals were done that way. First wood block cut print and then any details that were flowy I did with the Sumi ink brush uh, with a piece of bamboo, uh, traditional Sumi style. And um, those, all the profit to that goes to anything that's my merchandise. I don't keep that money. So we pick different uh, on my channel. I say, hey guys, anybody got a good, you know, fresh water uh, ecology or, or fish uh, conservation cause or uh, charity and I donate that um, and honestly it's usually anywhere from 20 to maybe in the holidays 200 or 300 dollars at most but um, that money uh, goes straight to causes for for um, preservation conservation and discovery um, and not my, not Ivan and I's uh, charity either, or, or nonprofit. Ours, if I can give it a little plug, the Green, Green Earth Alliance, that, yes. uh, I, uh, as he's called back home, Ivan or Ivan and uh, Yelka, his sister, um, and I, uh, she's like a tech whiz and just altogether social media and, uh, or, or, or uh, strategizing, planning dates uh accounting she's like machine. yeah she's a machine yeah totally <laughs> and uh I, ivan and i are a little more artist i guess um we we can deal in that realm but it, it was really nice to have her on board to kind of be like guys guys focus like we need to <laughs> talk, talk about this uh, i know uh, <laughs> i've experienced it firsthand as well alex she really is um the brains behind everything in ivan's world Oh yeah. She's, she's, I mean, Ivan will go make the art and then be like, I don't know, I'm gonna put on a hard drive and go do more art, you know, uh, you know, take more photos. And she's like, what are you doing? You have 800 thousands hard drives. Of, thousands of photos. Yeah. Uh, we should be licensing these. You should do this. You should do that. So she, she thinks really big and I, I really admire that too. Um, and she's just a brilliant lady and a kind lady. Mm -hmm. um but we got together we all hit it off when we started talking after his book after i kind of pushed his book and i think i sold like 130 pre-sales of the thousand two thousand or thousand that he did originally and he was really you know surprised so was i honestly at that price point on the book that youtube was that responsive at the time i think i had maybe fifteen thousand subscribers or something yeah yeah you've been and, close to that I and mean, i remember the live stream um, I was in the background. Oh, oh thanks. I was, I was <laughs> yeah. in, in the comments as Ivan. Uh, the time, so. <laughs> oh, okay. I remember uh, it well. Yeah. So, yeah, you know all about it then. But, um, you know, that whole whole thing, I was pretty impressed that uh, we were able to kind of get – at least some people into, you know, we had a lot of people sign up saying they wanted to help too. And so um, my idea for the nonprofit, cause they just knew they wanted to put Ivan's work. They wanted it to make money for conservation. And, yeah. and that's kind of what they came to me with like, let's brainstorm this. And, and I had always been obsessed with the idea of Kiva, which was a nonprofit that started around probably 2006 or so. And you would give money in the form of micro loans to uh, single women with children in the developing nation. 
and they would pitch an idea. So they would have access to like a, a laptop in, in like, um, a, a, maybe in Lagos, Nigeria, or in, you know, um, somewhere in Mozambique. And they would go to a rural or maybe even just a poor slum type area uh, or favela or something. And they would allow them to use the computer, uh, a camera and things like that. They have a site there and they'd say like, give us a business pitch. And with how much money in the West we have compared to what daily living costs other places, you know, a lot of times it would be like, I need to buy um, the time to bake bricks at a kiln um, in town. And I need the mud, you know, the mud's free, but I also need rebar and I'm going to make a pizza oven or a non, you know, bread, a flatbread oven. And then I'm going to sell that. And, um, you know, then I'll, I'll build my, my uh, business from there. Uh, and that was one example of a, a cause that I put $50 towards. She was, she only needed, I think, $400 for the whole thing to get her business up and going. And so then they pay back Kiva. Um, and I think, I, I believe it's still this way. I think there's no interest, but then you can, once they pay you back, you can give it to the next person. And so your money, you can keep rolling it over and selecting projects. Yeah. Um, and I really like that. But uh, Ivan told me this story about how, you know, he's always spending his own money on trying to preserve things or trying to help a cause. So like uh, in, in Venezuela, the, co the country's not in a good way financially, obviously, but there were specimens from like the 1860s all the way through the 1920s. A lot of them, one of a kind at a university of certain um, species of fish. And the problem was that the cork had rotted, like the formaldehyde or whatever was eating through the cork along with uh, maybe there was some sort of weevil or, you know, a little bug that was boring through it, but they were starting to lose specimens and they needed to buy new cork stoppers that were uh, rubber or plastic or whatever they were. And it was going to be, I think, $158 for like 250 of them, but nobody would approve it in the budget in Venezuela or at the university or, you know, and so it was a matter of Ivan just going on eBay or whatever and buying or Alibaba and buying stoppers and, and doing it. But that made me think when he was telling me that, like, what if we go to only we start, you know, focusing on developing nations and we talk to the people who have accredited PhDs or their doctorate students and we ask them what is standing in the way of you cataloging more fish and mm -hmm. um, doing more taxonomy, you um, doing a study on the fisheries or the ecology or sustainability of this or that. And, you know, a Western, you, you know, U.S. like Oxford or I mean, U.K. like Oxford, Cambridge or U.S. Harvard or or Stanford, um, you know, they'll, they'll spend one hundred and fifty thousand dollars just paying the professor for the study to go abroad. Um, you know, it may be two or three million dollars to get something done because they have to have insurance for getting kidnapped. They have to have, um, you know, the grad students fly down and they have to have. Uh, this and this and this and some of those regulations are obviously a good thing but also there's a lot of waste when you've got people that may even be educated in those same universities and they've gone back home maybe they got their degree in the 70s when the country like Iran or something was in a different way completely and you've got these ichthyologists these ecologists these biologists that are just you know screaming to 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 save something or they have a cause and one they don't have a social media outlet in the west or anybody with funding or two they just don't have the funding and so we thought let's let's eventually get this together so we're gonna try to make it more mobile friendly and everything and basically vet projects and allow people to say like i want to go catalog these seven suspected new species of faro wallace I'm going to need kerosene and petrol for the, uh, for the canoe to go for uh, three weeks up into the Amazon or whatnot. 
and uh, food supplies, and uh, I also need a wireless chip for my laptop or whatever it may be. Like there are these very, very achievable goals that could be mm -hmm. crowdsourced. So we, we said, well, why don't we bridge that gap? And also in the meantime, uh, Ivan and I both are into art and, and, um, and then now I've got a platform that's growing and he, he does as well, I would say, and a network of people. So we're like, let's put this to good use and 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 try to really amplify like the the where there's the most opportunity for gain like if a species isn't cataloged it's not going to make the iucn red list it's not going to be protected ever and mm -hmm. there's a lot of countries that don't want their species on that list because the locals there are making money off of collecting it or you know or they want to make gravel you know pebble mines or jewel mines or copper mines or whatever it is uh or logging uh and so they don't necessarily want to fund the research into these things um and a lot i feel like right now in in hindsight there's going to be a time when we look back and we we know it when we we hear it that that two-thirds of freshwater fish are either threatened or endangered now um and I think there's going to be a time in like a hundred years when we're going to say, what in the hell were we doing? Like as a species of humans, as a society, you know? And so hopefully we can maybe bring some attention to that. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's, that's the bigger goal in the channel. Like if I had to say, I, I can't have kids for, uh, because of an injury, but my wife and I really wanted kids and we tried for a long time. And now I've kind of decided that like my legacy is going to have to be something that that is, is given out to the world differently than taught to a, a kid, you know, kind of in that traditional sense. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really want to make it, you know, this a love and appreciation for nature and mm -hmm. um, and also just a general respect for humanity as well, like. Um, the develop be it the developing world or or oxford or cambridge um you know we're all people we and uh you know we all deserve the same respect and and you know rights mm. as one another in in my opinion so yeah mm. well it's a very very good cause uh, and hopefully it, it's a success um yeah we haven't really done our big like coming out you know we kind of it took us a while to get the um tax forms done and mm -hmm. the yelka was a pro at that she got like a lawyer for us they worked for free you know all these things but then we kind of need to tweak some board things and we need to get some insurance like there's just kind of these cover your back things that you would never even know about until you set up a non-profit 501c 3c yeah. so well, for the record I bought the, the first NFT and I was <laughs> one of the first NFT owners on the um, Discord. Yeah, so. right <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. How long ago was it established? What's that? How long ago was it established? Uh, we started it up during the lockdown, actually. Yeah. So, oh, uh, right, so like, uh, right during the beginning of it and then we uh the green earth alliance which is geo which kind of sounds like like when said which kind of sounds like gaia um that was yelka's uh doing which i like too you know i think that's cool and um you know we didn't even have a goal when we started it of like this needs to happen but it, we were like we we want to we want to change things for the better and we're sick of reading about you know, this dam's going up and it's going to ruin all these fish. Like maybe we can fund breeding projects for goodyids or for, um, you know, the Montebello dam in South America, the species that need saving uh, or, or wherever. Like, and we started with these like ideas and we're like, man, that problem is too big. And so we kind of just had to keep chiseling it away. And I think now uh, we, we created it a little prematurely just thinking, well, you know, a lot of people, I know a whole different crowd of people <laughs> and, you know, he knows a lot of scholarly folks and academics mm -hmm. and she knows a lot of kind of wealthy people and tech people. We, and then I know a lot of artsy people and, and also now through YouTube that, 
that crowd of uh, academics as well as hobbyists. And so we just felt like the three of us as a foundation were a really good, you know, triangle of sorts, like a base to like, we don't know what, but we got to do something to help the, the, this planet, you know, and fish. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and Ivan and I feel real, real similar about like, if it's for a good cause, we're, we both want to put our art or any of our creations or time completely, you know, yeah. mm. towards something. Mm. Uh, we've had a, a, another question from the floor. Yeah. Up. Uh, if you could only keep one species of fish, what would it be? And the follow-up to that, which was missed, is why would it be that particular species? Yeah. You know, it, it it's hard. It might be like an endler or a guppy just because of the genetic possibilities. I feel like I could have every one of every color fish eventually if I worked hard enough at it. <laughs> like in 10 years, I could probably end up with like a long fin, a short fin, a spade tail, a split tail. Um, so it, I might say that, and that's also my first love was guppies as a kid. Um, I mean, my first, first love was when I was five, I had a goldfish named Elvis, but uh, I won him at a, at a carnival where you threw pennies into shot glasses. And if you yeah. made it into one with the fish and hit it in the head or whatever with the penny, uh, you got to keep it. And, I remember how mad my mom was about that, but we kept it in a literal fish bowl with nothing in it. And it lived for four years in that thing, the poor thing. Um, but we just didn't know better, you know, then my mom felt bad for it when, when it died, finally, she got me another fish and, uh, it was, uh, uh or, or a fish tank, I should say for, I think it was for my 10th birthday, uh, something like that. And, she would literally every two weeks, she would take the entire aquarium, disassemble it, drain it, put the fish in a cup. She'd scrub the sides with soap and water and the plastic plants. She'd rinse the gravel. I mean, she'd scrub this thing till it was spotless, basically totally uncycling it. <laughs> and she'd do that every two weeks. And so if I ever missed a time, you know, they'd get ammonia poisoning and like, they're probably getting ammonia poisoning every week and a half anyways. But, um, you know, it's just, it blows my mind how we used to keep fish before there were as many resources on the internet. You know, you, you could go to the library, you could join a club or whatnot, but as a kid, it wasn't easy to feel like you could access all that uh, necessarily. You, you talk to the guy at your local pet store and especially when those were chain stores, when I was growing up, um, and a lot of the local ones were kind of going away. Um, it was a really sad time in that sense that we just got bad advice for mm. so long. Yeah. 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 Love it or hate it. The internet has done some really positive things for the fish keeping community, more so the fish that we're keeping, I believe. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. And, and I mean, at the end of the day, I, I usually say there's no right way to keep a fish, but there's a few wrong ways. So, like, as long as people are finding something that's enjoyable and sustainable, I think that's great. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And then that's a, an absolutely fair call. That, yeah, totally makes sense. Um, what is it about, like, aquatic life that, that fascinates you the most? I don't know. It's a primal draw. Um, ever since I was a little kid, there was something. Maybe it's a God complex. I don't know. But like when I was a little kid, I'd stand above a pond or a creek and I'd see fish or crawfish or, you know, crayfish or, or um, little um, caddisfly larva and frogs, whatever it was. And I was always just captivated by watching them. And I felt like I was this like omnipotent thing kind of looking down on their little world. And I was like, do they even know I exist? You know, as a little <laughs> kid. Um <laughs> And then the challenge of trying to catch them and then understanding like when they would like outsmart me somehow with some little maneuver and I'd be like, wait, how'd that little thing, like its brain is so tiny, like what is going on here? You know, like how is it so perfect at every little thing it does in its environment? Um, so from a really early age, it, it was something that I loved and it was something that um, has always given me a lot of peace. Uh, I've always been an anxious person, uh, especially when I was like working a nine to five type job and or in school. Um, 
with kind of uh, regimented uh, deadlines, but but more so just the um, approval of my peers and or a supervisor of some sort. Like I always didn't want to let people down and I've always had health issues my whole life. Um, and as well as just, um, I'll just say bad luck, but like a, a rough go of like having family members pass away and just unfortunate events basically that kind of got in the way of like, oh, you got to go out. You're not going to be in school for a month or you're, you know, I was in the hospital for a week this year and then two weeks that year and a couple times in my sophomore year. So there's kind of been this, um, yeah, this, this kind of, um, anxiety, fear, and also maybe depression or existential loneliness kind of thing. And, uh, feeling connected to the world, um, not being a particularly spiritual person in any one, um, like dogma or a paradigm that exists, I would say, um, it makes me feel like I understand my place in the world, or at least I understand the things around me and their place in the world and the value uh, that it's intrinsically around me. And I think that draws me to it, but why underwater? I don't really know other than maybe it's, it, it feels alien or it feels like I can't breathe under there. Mm -hmm. So, so I want to know more about this secret world, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, so we're getting pretty close to the end of our time. Um, I no think problem. we've probably had enough time to, to sneak one more question in, I think. Um, you've recently been away and, and spent some time catching some fish in their natural sort of habitats and, and yeah. waterways and stuff like that. You, yeah. You're planning on any more more trips like that, or is that just a... If they pay me to come, I will go anywhere. I mean, I mm. will go to a, you know, two people sitting in a field in, you know, Nebraska or whatever, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go to the, whatever, the Shetland Islands, if someone will fly me there and wants to hear me talk about something. Uh, so basically, it just comes down to affordability, you know, so, but I would love, I would absolutely love to go somewhere. And, and I've been spending time in Florida, because they've had me speak there at clubs a number of times. But mm -hmm. also, um, I'm kind of training myself. I have lupus, which is an autoimmune disease, and mm -hmm. it causes a lot of inflammation, especially in hot temperatures. Um, my, fire my ants. Yeah, or fire ants, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you saw that post. My legs are just now going down. It's been, I think it's been six days since any fire ants bit me, and I finally have my ankles back. Like, I just had these big swollen trunks of legs, and now I've got, like, bloody scabbed feet, but like they weren't even bloody. They were so swollen that they were just like weep. It was just gross. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have autoimmune reactions that are pretty strong for inflammation uh, to a lot of things, including bugs and Dr. Anthony and Arkoff, uh, Dr. Anthony Maseral <clears throat> and the uh, ornamental uh, research center or the research center for ornamental fish uh, in the Amazon. Uh I've done some, uh, I did a, like a coloring book for them, uh, for kids. And, uh, um, was that you? Yeah. That's all my art. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. I never knew it was you that did that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like, um, I do like Lucas Brett's, all his art and marketing. There's actually quite a few YouTube channels or nonprofits or professors that like need an infographic or, you know, a picture of something that they'll ask me and I'll, I'll do it. But, um yeah so and that started as something i was like oh, i'll just do it for free dr anthony and then we were like 80 hours into this project and i was like all right i i'm gonna need minimum wage here you know i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna need something you know? <laughs> uh but but i was hoping i could have you know uh, banged out that project in you know 30 hours and just said you know ta-da here i'm here to help um uh, but yeah they did end up paying me for that but you know that was a really really like fun project to work on and um she wants uh, uh, renee wants to do more and mm -hmm. uh, follow-ups and um just hearing about all that it's pretty exciting um and uh you know i 
I hope to go down to their center and to, to interact with the kids down there and mm -hmm. to um, just go collecting in the field. Um, I'm just literally afraid I will die. Like that sounds like a dramatic statement, but with without med modern medical help, you know, I really have to bring a big med kit um, because uh, like a bee sting can kill me. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you're whatever a day from the capital city at best case scenario, yeah, and you can't even access it by road either. Right, right, exactly. And so it's like it's a dream to go there, and but part of it's like I go, I'm going to Florida, so I'm getting used to the heat. Uh, I stayed almost 20 days this time. Uh, I had uh, uh, all my teeth got cracked in an accident, but uh, and, and broke. But uh, I have implants, so I had 10 implants mm -hmm. done when I was in Florida this most recent time, and um, I'm getting the top teeth done next. But you know, I'm kind of trying to tick off my list these health things. Um, I had backs, I had a couple spine surgeries too that I needed, um, but. I, I've been training with a pack on and just walking around my local neighborhoods and going up hills and through parks and things, just trying to get to a place where um, I have the best chance of surviving, <laughs> where I have the best, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm set for, for going to do these things. Cause it's, it really is a dream of mine to go there or Lake yeah. Inlay or uh, Papua New Guinea or Borneo, you know, any of those places. Mm -hmm. It would just absolutely blow my mind to go there. I, uh, Ivan wants me to meet him on the Colombian and Venezuelan border in some town. And he keeps saying like, oh, just come down. It's, it's no big deal, man. Just bring cash and, you know, it'll all work out. We'll use U.S. money and, you know, we can just pay the border guards off, um, brick, buy, <laughs> you know, a few cartons of smokes and we'll give them out as we go. And uh, I'll talk. I'll do all the talking. And I'm just like, we're gonna have to buy off border guards with guns and stuff. Like, <laughs> like this is uh, this sounds like a bit of a process, man. And he's like, Ivan's just got a way of making everything sound easy. I know, I know, <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. So, oh. yeah, but I, I hope to do that. So, any, yeah. anywhere in the U.S. or Europe, you know, Europe is a place that I absolutely love. I wanted to move to either. Uh, uk france or italy honestly i could have gone with any, any of them but france i speak french and so for me with the aquarium history and you know germany and france the the history so rich there too i mean the us is too but i with my health problems if i didn't have to pay out of pocket and with insurance the things that insurance doesn't cover in our country anymore mm -hmm. um with pr prior existing conditions i could work 30 percent less for 30 percent less money than i do already like i have an injection that's 1600 dollars a month just to keep me like functional with lupus wow. and uh in other countries it's about 180 dollars shot so mm -hmm. um that gets frustrating but you know just the culture and everything else too like i'm just like oh man i want to go i want to go to europe um but hopefully i can at least visit um sometime soon that that's an, another big you know goal for the near mm. future yeah well traveling is not that it, it's, it's a lot easier now than it was two years ago anyway so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, thank you guys. You know, I really appreciate your time and uh, all you guys are doing and everything too, you know. Uh, and, and it's cool to have this thing where you guys are like, we're, we're like different. We're like a triangle mm -hmm. of people around the world right now. It's, it's wild that we got this to work out. So, and, oh, and you guys, you guys gave me, that. you guys gave me such a heads up time wise, you know, like, Hey, will this work out scheduling wise? So, you know, just, Thank you. And thanks for everybody who's uh, tuning in and joining us too. Uh, I really do appreciate y'all stopping by and listening to these guys and little old me. <laughs> no, thanks for joining us. I know Cam yeah. will say the same thing. Yeah, very much. Um, so we've got quick uh, six six very short answer questions to fire away. We'd like to end our, in our, our live guests with. Uh, yeah. Very quick, very... Um, frivolous so let's rock and roll with that and we can, mm -hmm. we can close off so sure uh doing a coin toss you choose heads or tails heads usually heads? 
Controversial. You think we're alone in the universe? Yeah, it's normally tails. Mm -hmm. Am I alone, or are you like? Do you, do you think, as a whole, we're alone in the universe? Uh, yeah, no, I don't. But I don't think we'll ever see them. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever communicate with each other. Fermi paradox. If you could have a meal with anybody alive or dead, who would it be? Hmm. Uh, you know, wow, that's, that's really hard. Um, I feel like I need to say something like super impactful, right? Something off the cuff <laughs> and witty. Um, but not, and it sounds cliche, but I'd love to sit with like Jesus or Mohammed or, or Siddhartha, one of the, the big religious leaders, I guess I would, I would mm -hmm. find it very interesting to see the reality and the interaction and and if i was blown away by them then great you know then that's that's all the better for my my life and my well-being but um i'd love to see what all the hype is about you know what what's the the reality of any given mm -hmm. one of those kind of people yeah. cool uh paper scissors rocks which is your first call rock rock are you a tea or a coffee drinker tea tea and what is your unicorn fish that can be something you have studied never seen wanted to always keep in an aquarium be out in the wild and 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 see what what's that one one species for you yeah um i mean there's a lot in theory but lately i really i really like i'm i'm really drawn towards the um mormorids that are kind of unusual um i'd love a mormorid tank with the elephant nose black ghost knife fish um it's an elephant nose and a ghost knife you know um but it's a it's an electric fish as well and uh I'd, I, you can put a a receiver in the water and hear it clicking like even just a, a headphone jack put in a, a, a guitar amplifier. I don't know the safety of that, but apparently that you can hear the <laughs> you can hear the the like static clicking from it. Cool. And uh, wow. yeah, I, I'd love to Crazy. have a, a biotope of them or some Ultima Angels. I've always wanted those too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty. Well, nice. if you ever get down to Peru, you can bring some back with you. Yeah, well, you know, and I can also say the. The green and orange discus that Dr. Anthony Mazarol brings back yeah. are incredibly beautiful too. I saw some in person finally. He and I were both in Florida at, at uh, Grant Eater's house, and we were mm -hmm. able to. He brought Grant some, and man, I think those are more beautiful than any of the man-made lines I've ever seen. You know, well, that's one of the reasons they picked Iquitos, wasn't it? Because yeah. of those discus. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that sequel is quite nice because I, from memory, we've got Grant coming on with us next time we have a guest, so oh, that's cool. kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, nice little segue, so I think he's yeah, two weeks away, we've got him him coming on for a wee chat with us, so cool. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure, yeah. you guys. I like your yeah. shirt too, Cam. Thank yeah, you. I like it as well. Yeah. I noticed it earlier on. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorites, right. for sure. Yeah, so very yeah, thanks cool. very much for coming on. It's, it's greatly appreciated. So I'm sure everybody enjoyed it, and, and it's been fantastic to have some of your information and your knowledge pass through. So I uh, really appreciate your time. So thank you very much for joining yeah. us. Oh, yeah, well, thank you, guys. Yeah. Sorry, I rattle on. I rattle on tangents a lot. You know, that's, <laughs> well, if, that's if you fine. enjoy if you enjoy that, you'll like my channel. Come check it out. If you if you thought this guy did not shut up, then you probably won't like my <laughs> well, <laughs> style. Awesome. But thank you guys. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks right. for joining us. Have a good one, Tim. Catch you later. Bye.